Hey, welcome everyone to Document Write live stream. Here's Charles. <laughs> I love the enthusiastic thumbs up. <laughs> and yep. I am Portia. So we're both from Document Write. Document Write is a technical writing agency where we conduct documentation audits. We do user interviews and UX research, and we set up documentation best practices. We're both software engineers, and um, from our time working in companies, we realized that documentation, good documentation is really the game changer, but unfortunately, it's something that's always off of everyone's to-do list. So that's why we're here with the elves who work in the background so that you can go to conferences and you can do other stuff. That's actually what I said last uh, week to a client. So um, without further ado, we'll talk about what our presentation is about. So our presentation is ChatGPT for technical writers, mindset makeover. I'll go in one moment, I'll go into why we chose this topic. We're not gonna give you any um, <coughs> special, <coughs> excuse me. We're not gonna give you any special scripts. We're not gonna give you any uh, special prompts. This is gonna be a very meta conversation where we'll talk about like the history of like technology in general, um, be a very informal chat. And without further ado, let us formally introduce, let Charles formally introduce himself. Charles, take it away. Who are you? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Charles Mazzantini. I am a technical writer at Document Write. Um, as Porsche said, my background is in software engineering, uh, particularly JavaScript. Um, also, once upon a time, an author of a JavaScript and Ionic framework course. Uh, in my free time, I also make YouTube videos. And uh, based in the lovely surf coast, down under. Yay, Australia. Um, I guess a formal introduction about me. So my name is Portia. I'm the founder of Document Write. Um, I, in another life, I used to be a Django slash JavaScript developer, and I did a smattering of other things. I am representing sunny, sunny North Carolina these days. So, all right. So we did our intros and um, Charles. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Could you ask me the first question? <laughs> Why are we even talking about this topic? Because I like, um, good question. <laughs> We're talking, <laughs> you weren't prompted to ask that question at all. That, that was totally natural. Um, yeah. Since December, since uh, chat GPT 3 has come out, it just the reaction to it seems like it's very um, reactionary. It's either you're going to lose your job. Oh, my God. Mass unemployment. Or it's the secret weapon is chat GPT. Here are these prompts. Or it's let's completely put our head in the sand and pretend like nothing is happening. And I think what all of those responses have in common is that they're all very reactionary, very based in the now, and they really don't take context about how we've implemented technology in the past, um, how we thought about innovation. And um, quite honestly, what makes me sad is we're both technologists, right? Uh -huh. And I got into programming because I love the new and the command line, which can be yeah. sometimes an oxymoron. But I love the new. I love tinkering. And too many of our cohorts or too many people who are technologists they just had this really negative opinion of chat GPT. And it was just, it was just kind of defensiveness that just made me sad. And I wondered 
where's, I was wondering where this curiosity was, where's the curiosity? Because it felt like the fear was overriding the curiosity. And I always like to take out my anthropology, anthropology like background. So we're talking about this because I want to feel like studying biological anthropology was a really good use of my time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure what do you, you think always, about this topic, Charles? <laughs> I'm sure you can always find some way to make uh, uh, biological anthropology relevant. Um, what do I think? Um, I agree with you that I think um, a lot of people have uh, the the reaction has been more emotional rather than uh, rational. Right. Um. So that's definitely part of the equation. Even um, up to now, you still find a lot of um, criticism that is very stuck. Um, because even in the short amount of time that we've had ChatGPT, it's improved a lot yes. in the way it reasons, the way it um, provides answers, and also with the advent of this, um, what they're calling prompt engineering, of um, crafting your prompts in such a way so as to get the best answer possible. Um, so I do very much agree with you on that. Um, just wondering uh, exactly. So we seem to agree on what the bad mindset, bad in quotes, mindset looks <laughs> like. Right. So the question is, what do we mean by having the correct mindset? So we want to have a makeover of the mindset to what? I think the make that's a really great way of putting it, a makeover of mindset. And the best way to go about it is to lead with curiosity. Instead of making lots of pro proclamations, ask more questions. Like ask what exactly is ChatGPT or large language models? Um, where is this hype coming from? What, yeah, what are the reasons behind the emotions is really important. Um, it's really, and it seems like a lot of people are, one, they're afraid of their livelihoods. And two, they're afraid that some, oh, Charles, I'm sorry. Oh, I think uh, blame uh, sci-fi movies. Um, everyone thinks this is like the Terminator, Judgment Day, and that's it. We're done as humans. <laughs> yeah, and it's just such an extreme reaction. Um, and I always like to look at the history of it, and that's just who I am as a person. Like I'm, when I, I'm the kind of person that you can never go to me and tell me that um, children were better in the past neighborhoods were better in the past because I'm the kind of person that will just like go and give you historical events like about New York City during the 1970s, how it was in the toilet bowl, or I will talk about the heroin problem in Harlem during the 1930s. Like this, I hate romanticizing the past and I, but I always want us to be informed by the past when we're looking at the present. So, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on mindset? Like, how, how have you personally been processing ChatGPT and LLMs? Um, personally, I've been um, exploring. So um, I've just been trying out how to use ChatGPT in all sorts of different contexts. Mm -hmm. So, of course, to, to help with uh, things like research as far as... Uh, our technical writing is concerned, um, but also a bit of everyday stuff. Um, there's, so particular examples I can think of is um, day to day, there's some configurations that you need to do on your computer or solving like, you know, day to day problems. It's a lot faster to ask ChatGPT than it would be to uh, do a Google search find the correct um, tutorial or whatever. Um, it's a lot faster to get ChatGPT to answer questions for you. Um, 
also oddly enough um asking it like sort of mundane things um like sometimes definitions of words or asking for synonyms and things like that it's really useful um when when writing for that so i've been using Ch um, chat gpt for um a lot of different stuff you know um and i have found it to be very useful in a lot of different contexts and it has been getting discernibly better um much much better now than it was in uh january um and particularly with uh gpt4 mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it has this weird bug where it will just suddenly stop answering so suppose you're asking it for like um let's say in preparation for this and saying hey wh what are the 10 uh things you should keep in mind as far as uh mindset is concerned in the AI age. You make it seem like this whole conversation now was from ChatGPT. <laughs> uh, no, uh, of course, ChatGPT is part of my workflow um, mm -hmm. for almost everything. Um, but uh, of course, there's still significant human effort. Um, I promise I'm not working with the machines. Secretly. <laughs> uh, I I'm loyal to, to the humans. Um, <laughs> for now. Forever, forever. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so GPT-4, you ask it for a, ten, a, a list of 10 arbitrary things. It may suddenly stop answering at like seven. That's uh, interesting. And you kind of have to remind it, hey, you just stopped mid-sentence or mid-paragraph. And then it'll be like, oh, okay, sorry. And it'll try to continue again. Um, but it's... It's the, the quality of the answers are much better mm -hmm. with GPT-4 than they are GPT-3 in terms of like how it formats things. It's really getting better very fast. So, I feel like you use ChatGPT as like your personal assistant these days for everything. <laughs> yeah, for everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's definitely. Um, even for like things you would not expect, like asking for date ideas mm -hmm. uh chat gpt is like useful it's like a swiss army knife i use it for recipes right i i did not even think i was going to say that in this uh <laughs> in this chat. yes i use it for recipes but um chat gpt has been a game changer in terms of programming yeah i um it's really reignited my love for code because I am not at the very at my peak ability I'm a very average developer <laughs> and that's me working really hard and the thing is like I have lots of boring problems like I have like a syntax issue or indentation issue and yeah I mean I use linters but the problems I have were so boring that I don't think anyone really wanted to solve them because rightfully so, their time was better used doing other stuff. But my God, if you know chat, if you know like basic programming and you go to chat GPT, like I've had chat GPT analyze data for me. I've had it help me write scripts. I actually had it help me write a Django application not too long ago. There were definitely mistakes, but I think the game changer is if you already know your domain, then it's really, it is easier for you to be able to um, utilize ChatGPT to the fullest. But see, this is why we need someone else here in a conversation because we will just go on and on and on about how much ChatGPT Chat is great. This week, I was actually looking for a ChatGPT uh, skeptic to balance out the conversations we've been having because it's, it's too positive. <laughs> We're too much of fans. Uh, next question. So speaking about history, do we have any examples in the past where folks were panicking over new technology? Um, I, th I think pretty much that's the story with um, every groundbreaking technology. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's this book i think you mentioned it in last week's uh podcast by jason pfeiffer um uh, mm-hmm. the building for tomorrow um and i recall there's a section where he talks about um in the early days of the car a lot of people reacted very negatively to um the automobile um because people were or part of the reason was they were very fond of their horse um you know and it was like a big part of the family like um you know your dog or your cat is um so part of that is like being um very familiar with what you're used to and not wanting to let go of that i think as human beings we have trouble um letting go with letting go of things that we like mm mm-hmm. Um, and I think being a developer, we can uh, very much relate to that. Um, we are all, to some extent, uh, you know, fanatic about some kind of software that you use, or whether it's an OS. There are always these wars, like which OS is better, Windows versus Linux versus Linux. Mac. <laughs> <Continue>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll. I'll even though I agree, I'll just pretend. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's things like that. We have an emotional connection to the past. Um, going back to what you said about like people romanticize the past, right? Uh, maybe because suppose say you grew up in the 70s and you had a beautiful childhood, you think everything about the 70s was great, right? So I think that's part of the thing. We are, we are, we are very emotional about things that we like. And as much as humans have been, you know, very adaptive, we don't like the process of having to adapt. Right. Yeah. So that's my take. I don't know. What's yours? Yeah, I know. Um, getting back to Jason Pfeiffer's book, uh, Building for Tomorrow, I, getting back to your car example, too, I think the profound thing that he said about cars is that they were actually more dangerous. Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't a figment of imagination that at a certain point, a horse was probably the better way to go. And he mentions that just because you have a new technology doesn't mean that you actually have the ecosystem to support the technology. So when cars were being adopted in cities, there weren't a whole lot of traffic lights. There were traffic rules. There weren't like different safety mechanisms in the car. And I think this goes back to ChatGPT where it's like people say, well, it can't, it's not creative or it has all these um, errors and mistakes and technology evolves. Like the car wasn't great when it first came out. If anything, it was kind of a deaf machine, but it didn't stay a deaf machine. Like we made, um, we progressed beyond the problems and we created an ecosystem. And I think it's a conversation that I don't see is that we talk about chat GPT in isolation, but I would love to have more conversations about what ecosystem, how are we adapting? How are school systems adapting in terms of when they give out an essay? How is the workplace adapting? How is the government adapting? So I think not only do we need to talk about chat GPT, but we need to talk about exactly how are we going to receive this technology? How are we going to take our ways and innovate into this kind of technology, just like we innovated our way into automobiles? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so what I'm hearing is, um, we need to like think very critically about it. So yes, it's still a nascent, very imperfect technology with um, issues like uh, bias, inaccuracies, etc., and also this limited understanding of context. Um, it does give this a veneer of being able to understand language, but it actually doesn't. It's more like uh, statistical models that help it come up with the right words and they're coherent. Um, but these limitations aren't a reason to be a bystander. Right. Um, because we actually need our 
uh, active effort, as you said, in all spheres from academia to um, uh, the private sector to the government in terms of shaping what the future looks like with these tools. Um, so in terms of mindset, it should be a mindset of collaboration and synergies. Thank you for bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. So thinking critically uh, and think synergies and collaboration. So because what I, what I hear a lot of people um, on the skeptical side talk about is they'll mention all the shortcomings and conclude that there's no point using it or whatever the conclusion is. But rather, I think it's important to be aware of those things so that you can augment the shortcomings with the human effort and ingenuity that it can't replicate at this point. Um, yeah. But definitely, um, it's going to get better, and we need to shape how it gets better. Right. And we need to be part of the conversation instead of putting our head in the sand, pretending it's not happening. And look at the internet. Like, um, who would have thought in 2000 that we would be able to have a live stream and post it in different places? Like, in 2001, if I would have showed you a video, you could have said, well, this is really glitchy, it's really slow, and a TV is better. And in 2001, you would have been correct. But you're yeah. not correct in 2023. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's a brilliant example with regards to video because um, sometimes even like not even as far back as 2001, but if you look at like really early videos from like the mid 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, like some of the earlier videos on YouTube, and you see the quality only goes to like 240 uh 240 pixels right and it's shocking how bad that video is now that we're in the era of full hd ultra hd you know 2k 4k etc um so just that as an example shows you like how far we've come in a very uh short amount of time and the innovation and improvement seems to be um increasing pace and compounding um sort of pivoting on the issue of uh academia that you talked about and in terms of adapting mm -hmm. um, ritu patel in the comments asked should a tech writer or anyone cite content when turning to chat gpt and how um i think that's a definite yes you should um cite when you're using chat gpt um in just as you would do with any other resource. Um, of course, you want to maintain things like academic integrity, professional integrity. So you should definitely cite um, ChatGPT as a source. Um, how exactly to do that? I believe that um, the different uh, referencing um, styles do have um, updates on how they do it. Um, as a matter of fact, I was working on a paper where I did actually cite ChatGPT in oh, wow. um, IEEE format. So basically, <laughs> you mention you mention the name of the tool, so it would be ChatGPT, the creator of the tool, OpenAPI, um, and then you put in the prompt that you, so the exact prompt that created the output um, that you then used in whatever work you're doing. And then um, I believe the date that you uh, made the query. Um, so definitely you should cite, and the major style guides do have guidelines on that. So, oh, wow, really? Um, yeah. Um, and a lot of universities, I think they quickly realized the potential that it had. And a lot of them have actually um, updated their uh, referencing guides and things like that. That was so quick. That, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think because of how groundbreaking it is, they had to be quick. Right. Uh, because um, I've heard stories about how entire classes just started uh, copy-pasting answers from ChatGPT. 
It's so uh, tempting. Yeah. Uh, but it will get you caught because, uh, uh, well, your professor will be aware of what you've uh, done before, the quality of work that you've done before. And if it suddenly changes, yeah. You could have said you've gotten a tutor. Well, I, am not, I am not here promoting cheating, by the way. Um, no, but that's a conversation I wasn't even thinking about academia. That is definitely something I'll have to sit on in terms of, okay, so I guess the compromise is citing chat GPT in your sources. Yeah. Okay. And I think because you give the exact prompt, it'll um, sort of reveal to what extent that was your original effort and to what extent you uh, more or less copy pasted. That's super interesting. Yeah. I do wonder if there's like a threshold of editing. Like, when are you copying? Oh, uh, you got to thank you. Um, yeah. It's the threshold is when are you copying? When are you heavily borrowing? And one of you are just heavily editing what ChatGPT is sending you. Um, it's so I'm really interested, like, are there thresholds to you are cheating or you are being helped yeah. or this is your original content? Yeah, um, I think the key thing that they look at is honesty. So if your work is, um, so if you're copy pasting, Mm -hmm. um, whether it's from ChatGPT or it's from a textbook or another academic paper, um, you oh, can, do that. Yeah. yeah, you can do that and then indicate in quotes like this is a direct quote from whatever work. Um, so long as the entire body of work has a, a significant element of originality, even copy pasting from ChatGPT is okay. Where the line is drawn in terms of uh, crossing the line from crossing the line into academic dishonesty is mm -hmm. are you being honest about where this came from? Right. Right. So you pretending that ChatGPT output is yours, that's a red line. That's super interesting. So speaking yeah. about more red lines, can you tell us what does the law say about large language models and ChatGPT? Where are they drawing their line? Right. So this is a very interesting and right now um, open question with regards to uh, where we are at legally. So in terms of um, copyright, right, that's one very interesting area. Mm -hmm. um, so who actually owns the copyright to chat GPT's output? Um, can ChatGPT be considered like a legal person and it owns whatever it says after you prompt it? Um, so that's a very interesting question. Um, OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, mm -hmm. it actually assigns you the right uh, title and interest of the output to the user. So as far as they are concerned, um, whatever output comes from ChatGPT um, is yours. Of course, subject to other um, terms and conditions, but if you read their terms and conditions under um, section three, content, um, they so they, they assume that the input is yours, you have the rights to the input, and therefore you will have the rights to the output. Um, of course, it'll be a bit different if you if your input is um someone else's copyrighted work um Which i'm not sure what... be yeah because uh, if you look at the corpus of chat gpt it's taking from places like reddit it's taking from places like um stack overflow and it's taking from github and what i've read some of the co or it's taking from getty image if you're looking uh, getty image uh chat gpt Sorry about that. Ch Dolly. So OpenAI also owns the company, Doll, um, the framework Dolly, correct? Yep. Okay. So the image example holds up. 
I was reading that if you go into Dolly and it creates an image for you, there is even like that copyright sticker. What do you call that? We have a piece of art and watermark. Yep. Watermark. So Dolly is actually taking work that's already that has a watermark on it. In terms of code, it's taking a lot of code from GitHub, but OpenAI has not been clear on does it actually look at the license before it puts the code in the corpus? And there are many people who say, hey, we had a rather restrictive license where you weren't supposed to take this code for commercial prop, uh, purposes, but this is a commercial purpose. So what does the law say about that? And where does ChatGPT go from there? Yeah, um, just to clarify a bit, um, mm -hmm. In what I was saying, input, the input in that context, it's the prompt. So there's three like different pieces here. There's the training data, right. um, which cert certainly did include um, some copyrighted uh, material. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's the prompt that you use. So because the prompt is also like part of the process of getting the output, there may be copyright implications with regards to that. And then there's the output itself. So OpenAI says that so long as the input is yours, the output is yours. Thank you for uh, the clarification. Yeah. Because I and, meant OpenAI was at fault and not the user who actually created the prompt and used the output. Yeah, so you could actually input copyrighted material and then that also uh, moves around the equation. Um, yeah. So in terms of what the law says, um, it's it depends and depends a lot on the jurisdiction and the specifics about copyright law in that jurisdiction. Um, so, for example, in uh, Australia, where I'm based, mm -hmm. um, Peter generated text or code can actually be classified as uh, a literary work for copyright purposes. So in theory, it can. However, the uh, there is what's known as, so there's various subsistence criteria. Mm -hmm. And one of that is um, independent intellectual effort, right? Uh, and authorship and originality. Right. So this will be looked at on a case by case basis because it depends a lot on the input. Um, but it's likely that you, um, they'd say that content produced by AI wouldn't meet um, the authorship criteria since AI as yet is not a recognized person. Um, but then, for example, in the European Union, they have um, provisions in the law where they have exceptions like for things like data mining. Um, so companies are allowed to mine the internet for data and use that in, for trading um, AI models or whatever big data applications that they're using that for. So it's very jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, generally, there tends to be some um, predictability, but because this is such a new technology, it's sort of putting to test a lot of things that were a lot of assumptions that we thought were just, you know, universal baseline assumptions. Yeah. A lot of things that we haven't questioned in a very long time. Yeah. Are now being put in the forefront. And it's like, well, what is ownership? What is um, property? But in terms of copyright and GitHub, that has actually been an issue for the past decade or so. Like okay. with GitHub and code and licenses, like it, it was a problem, but it was not, this problem seems like it's been automated and it's been a bigger problem because of technologies like chat GPT. But I mean, open source projects have been arguing since the beginning of GitHub, hey, how much of my code can you use? And how, if we have a license and it's broken, how can we enforce it? Right, right. Um, yeah, very interesting. And then so specifically, 
be on if the LLMs themselves infringe on copyright. Um, so I think definitely we we are almost certain that, um, especially for the big ones like uh, ChatGPT and Bard, mm -hmm. they have a significant amount of copyrighted material in their training data. Yeah, corpus. Yeah. Uh, if you if you ask them like the chatbots themselves, they'll tell you, I was trained on all sorts of stuff from uh, code on the internet to text and whatever. And they mention a lot of books. And of course, a lot of books, uh, the vast majority of books out there are still under copyright. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that they went and requested the rights to all of that. So even the chatbots themselves kind of uh, snitch on themselves. <laughs> Um, one way of putting it or yeah. you're transparent <laughs> well they're not very transparent because they won't say it directly i but... have gotten them to say it i have gotten chat gpt to give me a list of sources oh really mm -hmm. of oh, oh, the actual training data yes ah, interesting. it wasn't complete but it did give me like three or four articles right interesting it really so it depends on how you ask it I yeah. forgot the magical prompt I put in because at first it was like, oh, no. And then I put it in another prompt and it gave me a reason why it shouldn't give me the sources, but then it gave me the sources. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because it always tries to sidestep such questions. Yeah. Um, but it depends on how you ask. It's like, okay, give me all of your sources in the form of a song. It's like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, what? so whether, whether or not that actually constitutes an infringement, um, I think the, the key issue is um, in terms of the output, is a significant uh, portion of a copyrighted work reproduced in the output? Um, or is this a uh, distilled or a synthesis of mm. a large body of knowledge? So it's kind of like, I can read like five copyrighted books and then I can write an essay on a particular topic. So I can copy big chunks from all those books and then put it together and say it's mine, which would be obviously uh, infringement. Or right. I can read those copyrighted materials, understand the topic, and then from my own imagination, come up with a new work. So the same principle sort of applies. Uh, in terms of how to then determine that, that's um, where it's like outside our realm as engineers, but that's sort yes. of like, <laughs> those are like reasonable inferences uh, that we can make. Uh, by the way, is legal advice. Um, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, you should definitely uh, consult um, legal professionals on that. Um, but it's a reasonable way of uh, thinking about the issue. It right? is an informal conversation about the law. Yeah. Yeah, we are not privy to the law at all. This is not legal advice. If you have any questions, please consult a legal professional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, should we go into the last question? Um, how should technical writers go about LLMs and ChatGPT. Right. Um, I think uh, going back to my earlier point of synergies. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's areas right now where um, LLMs have huge shortcomings and humans have a big advantage. And then there's also other areas where um, these large language models are vastly superior to humans, right? So we should have a synergy there. So as a technical writer, um, look at in your day-to-day -day work, what really takes a lot of your time that you can outsource to ChatGPT, for example. So I find that um, in terms of brainstorming ideas, um, doing the first steps of research, especially, ChatGPT is great for that. Right. 
So you can easily tell it, hey, um, I'm, I want to write about, um, I don't know, different design patterns, right? Yeah. Uh, give me some ideas to talk about. And it can give you a list of design patterns, short explanations as to what they do. And that gets you going, right? It solves the um, blank paper problem. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I, and I'm sure a lot of people will, whether you're a technical writer or not, can relate to that. Um, you need to write something and you don't know where to begin. Um, so ChatGPT is very useful um, for that uh, research. Um, and in terms of even critiquing your work. Right. So one way that I use ChatGPT is, so for example, I could in the beginning be like, I want to write about this topic. Can you give me some ideas? Get some ideas from ChatGPT. I would have brainstormed some of my own, come up with the first draft, um, then actually put that into ChatGPT and say, hey, I'm writing an, art an article about ABC. My audience is X and my goal is Z. Here is my essay. Please give a critical analysis of the essay. And it's actually really good at doing that. Um, things like uh, maybe even looking at your, your like how effective your uh, writing is, the structure, etc. It's really good at doing things like that. It's like an editor. Um, yeah, yeah. An editor that you can ask follow-up questions. Yeah, um, and then you don't have to worry about bothering. Like instead of like calling a friend on the phone, it's like, hey, can you read this? Or can you look through this? Like it's, it's there 24 seven. Yeah, yeah. And um, you can even ask it for further ideas. So um, definitely look at what are the pain points in your workflow and in your process. Um, what can, what don't you like doing that you can sort of outsource to this machine? But definitely it's not a replacement um, as yet. I was about uh, to say, yeah. now it's not a replacement. We can't speak for the future, but. <laughs> Maybe when we reach the singularity, then it's going to be a different story. But as now, Sorry. yeah, uh, until next month or whenever. <laughs> oh, whenever, yeah. It's, it's synergies. It's humans plus AI to create something better. Right. Um, I'm going to get to this question, but before I do, uh, Ritu Patel, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. You mentioned how does ChatGPT compare to other AI tools. Um, we were talking about that in terms of like BARD. Before I get to the first question, I'm going to go get to the second question. OpenAI actually has some amazing courses on how to use um, LLM. It's, uh, I would definitely check that out. And document right, we are creating a course too about chat GPT for technical writers. So if you just want to get the updates, we're going to have the link to the newsletter below and you can just read the newsletter uh, ways and different tricks and tips on how you can use AI as a technical writer. Um, I'm actually going to leave the first question to Charles, because I know, Charles, you've been experimenting more with BARD than, than I have. Yeah, so um, for, you know, ChatGPT is like the, 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 the more popular one, um, but Google also does have uh, a conversational AI uh, LLM called BARD. Um, Microsoft also integrated uh, the ChatGPT model into their Bing search engine. Um, so there's and a Opera has done that as well. Yeah, Opera as well. You can yeah. access ChatGPT directly in their browser. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, tools that are available in the market. Um, and then from those primary tools, there's a lot of derivatives. So perhaps the uh, other companies integrate with their like API. Jasper or Mark yeah. Prompt. Yeah, Mark Prompt for documentation. Um, also, for uh, yeah, I've been. I'd say uh, for Jasper. I used to use Jasper, 
and it was okay. But since uh, GPT 3.5 came out, I canceled my subscription because ChatGPT was just a better interface than Jasper. When I wanted to help, when I want Jasper to help me write drafts, I would have to go at least through like five or six different dialogue boxes before I was able to get any output. With ChatGPT, it's one click and I'm able to get uh, output. And Mark Prompt is what we've been using, it's what we've been experimenting internally. So Mark Prompt is an add-on, a ChatGPT add-on for technical documentation. It's an API. So what we do, what we did internally was we took Mark Prompt and we put it as a plugin for this platform called DocuSaurus. And we have been using it as a replacement for search. And I would say that it's indexing is definitely better than some of the paid stuff that I've used in the past. Mm -hmm. The purpose of Mark Prompt is to take your documentation and distill the most important parts of it. So if someone has a question, Mark Prompt takes what you already written and then it gives a summary. And from the summary, it gives you a list of pages that you can choose from. The summary needs some more work. Sometimes it just directly takes from the documentation, but it leads you to the right place. And so I would have to say like, um, if, you're, if you like to code and if you want a custom documentation platform using Mark Prompt and DocuSaurus, I think is a really good combination. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely. Um, so to address uh, Ritu's question directly, how ChatGPT compares to the other AI tools? Um, so it's it depends because there's now a bunch of different tools out there and a lot of them tend to be very niche and specific right like for example jasper being about um uh copywriting yeah. uh mark prompt being about uh summarizing and explaining documentation mm -hmm. uh, whereas chat bard etc are more uh general purpose right um i think chat gpt where it has the edge is in terms of um having the head start and having had like um a lot of funding and and putting in a lot of that initial work in getting set up in, and getting it trained on a vast data set right. um and in t so chat gpt has a lot of uh uh breath in terms of the areas that are covered and also a little bit of depth, right? Whereas for some of these other tools, they're very niche, very specific. And so they will have a huge advantage in their uh, niche area. So it really depends on um, what you're using it for. So in terms of the general purpose ones, um, the other big one being uh, Bard, uh so i tried out bud earlier this week and i thought it was pretty good for a product that um literally was in response to uh, <laughs> the big waves that chat gpt was uh making but i thought it was really good the in i like the interface better than the chat gpt interface um i wish it was it were easy to access past conversations as you can do easily in ChatGPT, because uh, in ChatGPT it like records all your prior, prior conversations, and you can actually go back to a conversation. And actually, uh, a power tip: you want to make your conversations more or less about the same subject. So, if say, for instance, you were talking about, um, you were asking it questions about Java programming in one tab. You want to keep that on that same topic because it uses the memory of the previous answers to inform the next answers. So it, it, it help, using one, con one conversation for one thing um, sort of helps to keep it in context. That's right. pretty cool. 
because you don't have to keep giving it the same background information over and over and over again. It already has that in memory. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the two are, they are about at par, I think. This is with ChatGPT5. I think when you factor in GPT-4, ChatGPT is ahead of uh, BARD. Um, but um, yeah, I think right now, the, uh, the thing with GPT-4, as I mentioned earlier, is it's still buggy. So it'll just stop answering uh, mid-sentence, um, which is really annoying. But the quality of the answers that come from GPT-4 are really high. Uh, and by the way, GPT-4 is only available um, under the paid subscription, which I think is a steal in terms like of the price. Yeah, $20 yeah. a month, which is a steal uh, considering the value that you get. Um, I don't believe that Bud has a premium tier now, or at least I haven't come across it. Um, so still experimenting with that. Um, there's also uh, Bing AI Search. But what I was kind of annoyed with there, I haven't tried it out because uh, Microsoft forces you to use uh, the latest version of Edge in order to access it. And yeah, I'm kind of fanatical about my browsers, so I then didn't check that out. Uh, yeah, but I will give it a go and actually see how, how that goes. Um, I have a lot of questions. So, Bing is my, does Microsoft does Microsoft own Bing or part of Bing? Because I know Bing is a Chinese search. It's a Chinese search engine, or but it's does Microsoft mm -hmm. own part of Bing. I, I, it's Microsoft search engine. It's wholly theirs. So, isn't it using ChatGPT then? Yeah, it, it has, uh, so there's like two flavors. So there's um, a conversational search component. And then there's a more like chat GPT like uh, interaction, right? Ah, where, okay. So it has a search where you prompt it and it uses that AI to like um, supercharge their results. Um, but as well, it has, um, you know, more conversational AI thing like ChatGPT. That's super interesting. I have to say that um, this would probably, I don't know, I like Firefox because I like the privacy, but I'm super interested to see where Google's going to go in terms of their AI suite because I like ChatGPT, but I have to say it is annoying to open up another tab and to like ask all the questions. If I could just have it more integrated in my browser experience, uh, that would be a plus one. Yeah, but, I uh, believe so. Google is doing that. So Google actually has, you could use Bard, I think it hasn't released for me, but in for certain people, like if you want to write an email, it actually gives you suggestions and it works like a chat GPT, but you're actually in Gmail, which is, which is cool. Yeah, definitely. I think that was one of the big highlights at um, Google I.O. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, I also have not been invited to the party on that one. Uh, I suppose we're not the cool kids. Okay, uh, so they gave me a half invite. Okay. They gave me like a you can hang out in a hallway invite, but you can't actually go to the event. So they did ask me, maybe they've done this to you too. They did ask me if I wanted to um, check out their experimental features. Okay. So there's a beaker I press on it, but they have yet to roll out the chat GPT um, in Gmail. And that being said, we are four minutes to the hour. So we are going to have to wrap this up. Um, are there any last minute questions we should get to? Um, I haven't seen any in the, um, in the chat box. Yeah. But, uh, Christine Ritu, thank you so much for your encouraging comments and thank you so much for your insightful questions. Yep. Um, I think j just to summarize, um, 
on the question of what exactly is the right mindset to have, mm -hmm. um, I think we can summarize it as so. Uh, tread carefully, but tread nonetheless. Yes. Um, for the legal matters, seek legal advice. Um, don't just copy and paste the output. Add significant value to it because the most value that you're going to get from these uh, LLMs and AI in general is synergies between human effort and machine efforts. So I think that's the mindset that we should uh, approach these tools with. I think you said it perfectly. Yeah. yeah. The only thing I can add is just keep historical perspective in mind. Like you're not the only generation. You're not the only person that has been intimidated by new technology. And the phase is pretty similar. It's the panic, adaptation, the new normal, and then we will never go back. We will probably never go back wholesale to record players. We probably would never go back wholesale to fax machines. And so, yeah, won't go back, I think, is in the horizon. But from there, just keep all these feelings in a perspective to just how we deal with and handle technology in general. So I think, and just have a growth mindset, have a, have a mindset of curiosity. Yep, absolutely. So thank you everyone. We're gonna do this weekly. And once again, we are releasing a course over the summer. And so if you're interested about our course in technical writing and LLMs, you can go into the comments and I will put a link to the newsletter. And thank you so much. All right, folks. See you later. Uh, Bye.